Okay, welcome to our session today. There will be a lot of nice pictures and the form you need to wait a little bit. Our first speaker will be Scott Sheffield to speak about some stuff between random searches and quantum Levener equation. Uh, yes, thank you. So, um, this talk is about computer simulations, pictures, things you can draw, uh, growth processes that you can easily produce on a computer, and certain cases in which you can actually make math out of these things. So, in theory, it should be fairly easy to make a simulation on a computer and, and run it. As you see, we've had a few technical difficulties with that this morning. Um, but usually, things you invent are hard to describe mathematically. But let me just show you some of these uh, simulations to begin with. Here's a, this movie. This is a particular kind of growth model. I mean, what is it? It's a glow growing blob of bacteria, cancer, or I don't know, something. Gradually, this is growing, and, and, and you can see the interface is some kind of random fractal curve along the boundary. And as time goes along, we're absorbing more and more space. And I'll explain later how exactly I'm doing this. Um, but let me just, for warm up, show you another thing that's it's fairly different from this, uh, if I can. So let's see. I want here. I guess I go up one. Oops. That's not. I wanted to show it in the Let's see. There we go. Right. So here you have something that. If you can see, it grows in a kind of more spiky, spiny pattern. But it's a, a similar sort of process. Okay. And then here's this original growth picture again. You see occasionally you swallow up bubbles and then gradually fill them up. talk is joint work with Jason Miller, and we'll discuss something called the quantum Lovner revolution, which is, I say, a way of making mathematics out of these strange growth processes that occur in many natural settings. Okay, so first of all, I want to discuss the notion of a, a random surface. Um, so, here's a story. Imagine I give you a piece of paper, a pen, a ruler. You can try this on your own. You divide the paper into squares in size, and you cut it, the squares. Now you have your 12 squares. And you are going to randomly kind of stitch them together. So you'll find some glue, and you'll pick an edge, and you'll glue one of these edges to the edge of another square. And then you can pick another edge and glue it to another edge. And you find that, well, here I've got all 48 edges. And I can find some way of mapping each one of those edges to one other of the edges. So find a way of pairing up these edges and then glue the pairs of edges. And then I have some sort of a surface. You can think of it as a, a random two-dimensional manifold. And if you like, we can condition on the event that the manifold is orientable and simply connected. Okay, so um, these are sometimes called the, the drunken quilt maker models where you're uh, just drunk enough that it's not a flat quilt, but not so drunk that it fails to be simply connected. And um, here's an example of an actual surface made out of paper. So you kind of, I think, you physically cut these papers out and glue them together. This is with triangles, but it's a very similar concept. And, uh, and you might ask, what does this look like if you do it randomly when you have a large number of squares, or a large number of triangles. Well here, this is a simulation done by uh, Marquette, where he actually 
chose uniformly at random one of these quadrangulations, and then use some software to embed it, the graph, in the, well, kind of in three dimensions and projected onto two dimensions so you can sort of see it. And this is some picture, I won't say exactly how the embedding works because I don't fully understand it either, but it's some software for displaying the graph so you can see what's going on. You see there are lots of kind of narrow tentacles, it has a weird fractal structure. Okay, so this simple problem of taking the uniformly random uh, quadra quadrangulation, like uniformly among all ways of making a surface, uh, has been studied for a long time. It goes back at least to the work of Tut uh, around 50 years ago in the 1960s. Um, there's been a lot of work in combinatorics where you enumerate all of, you know, how many ways are there to glue together these squares to make a simply connected surface. Um, probability. You know, you talk about the scale limits of these guys. There's a lot of stuff in the physics literature. Um, partly because it was believed that these surfaces uh, should play a role in, in string theory, where if you look at the time evolution of a string, uh, that's a two-dimensional manifold, kind of embedded in a higher dimensional space. And kind of the intrinsic structure of that two-dimensional manifold was thought maybe to have something to do with these surfaces. And there's you know, I won't say they really understand the string theory side very well, but that's, um, that's the motivation. And, and there's been a ton of study of this object in uh, the physics literature for that reason, and it's sometimes called uh, quantum gravity. So two-dimensional quantum gravity is the study of two-dimensional random surfaces like this. Okay. Um, and uh, so this thing is a metric space, and... So it's known, this is work of uh, Miguel, Schaefer, uh, Miramo, and other people uh, have managed to show that if you look at this as a random metric space, and then you take the limit as the number of squares gets larger, then it converges in the space of random metric spaces, kind of a gromo house -Hauss topology, which is some topology on a set of metric spaces. It converges to a continuum random metric space. And uh, that metric space was shown by Lugal, uh, it's homeomorphic to the two-sphere. Okay, so this thing really is topologically a sphere in the limit, which you would expect because we're insisting that it be topologically a sphere, simply connected at each uh, approximation. Um, and, uh, okay, so this metric space limit is sometimes called the Brownian map. And, an important tool in doing this is that so the combinatorics that Chasing Sheffer introduced is really based on the idea that you can take a pair of trees and glue them together and make a surface out of a pair of trees. Okay, so this um, I'll kind of explain in this picture how that's done. So here's another embedding of a quadrangulation. And if you look here, you'll see a bunch of quadrilaterals. Well, not exactly straight edges, but you have a bunch of uh, shapes with, with four vertices, not the ones on the outside, those are triangles, but all the ones in the inside are, um, are quadrilaterals, where you have two red vertices and two blue vertices on, on the outside. Okay, so this is a bipartite graph, red and blue vertices, and the faces, um, except for the, the ones on the boundary, all the faces inside have four edges. And um, what you can do is, for each one of these quadrilaterals, I can decide to draw an edge from the red to the red, or from the blue to the blue. And um, here, I've taken some and I've drawn an edge from the red to the red, and I've done it in such a way that this forms a spanning tree. So there are no cycles in this collection of uh, red edges. On the other hand, it, it forms a spanning tree, meaning every red vertex is in the tree. Okay? And, uh, and here I take the dual tree, where all of the faces where I didn't add a red, I draw a blue there, and I get a dual tree. This is a blue tree. Okay, so now if you can kind of visualize this, you have these two trees, a red tree, and a blue tree, 
And in between them, you have these edges, which are, um, well, they are these black edges that kind of go in between the two trees. See, so kind of, you think, what if you have this pair of trees together with a bunch of edges connecting one tree to the other? And you can kind of imagine you're sort of going around the boundary of the tree, drawing edges connecting one to the other. So we always have this image that I start with these two trees. Here's another tree. And then I go through and kind of put edges in between the two trees. And the result is a, well, it's a random graph embedded in the plane, like what you see here. Okay, so now, um, so you need to have the trees together with these, these set of edges. Now, um, let me show you another thing. There's, there's a path. Here, what we have is now a green path that is drawn in between the two trees. So this path goes through, and one at a time, it goes through each of the edges of these pairs of trees. And it's now a space-filling path, in some sense. It goes through every triangle of this graph, and it kind of snakes around the entire thing and uh, uh, comes back to its starting point. So that's the loop, sort of, in between the pair of trees. And, you know, one way of encoding this pair of trees is to imagine that you, you fix a blue vertex and you fix a, a red vertex and you uh, call those your roots. And then as you draw this green path, you keep track as you go of what's the distance of the edge, the, the white edge you're crossing uh, along the blue tree from the blue root and what's the distance from the red tree, from the red root along the red tree. And that gives you a pair of numbers for every edge that the green thing crosses. And you can kind of check that if you keep track of what that pair of numbers does in time, um, that's kind of a two-dimensional random walk, and that kind of encodes the entire structure of this surface. Okay, so there's a way of encoding uh, the surface by a, a walk in 2D. And if you didn't quite follow that, just think it's a pair of trees stitched together. All right. And, um, you know, the way we actually did this simulation is that you take each one of these quadrilaterals and you put a little decoration inside of it, which is just done so that when you added this decoration, uh, your new graph has no double edges. And um, so anyway, you put this little structure inside each one of these quadrilaterals, and then you take the circle packing. And that tells you, it turns out there's a unique way to pack this with circles. And that kind of rigidly tells you how to embed this thing in the plane. Okay. And here's the picture showing, by color, the order in which the circles were added. All right. So anyhow, that's that's all cute. Generally, uh, if I give you any uh, surface, you might ask, how can I conformally map that surface to a a disk, and the, Re the Riemann uniformization theorem says that you can always do that. If I give you a, uh, a nice simply connected Riemannian manifold, you can conformally map it to a, to a disk, and um, you know, conformally it kind of locally preserves angles, and, um, and then the metric uh, will take this form, let's see, let me turn this this way. Uh, you know, each of the something z for some smooth function. So if I look at this, the metric down here, basically at a little point near uh, on this space, this will be the image of some region up here, uh, but the region up here may be stretched or squashed in order to get down here. So the area of little region here will be some, I mean roughly some constant times it's actually Euclidean area, say in the neighborhood of a particular point. If I want to describe the metric down here, at every point I need to give you a fun I need to tell you how much the map scales as I go from up here down to here. 
And so basically, this, the whole structure of this map up here is determined by this function down here that, um, that tells you the derivative, kind of derivative of the map from here to here. So how much locally a point is scaled. So, um, so basically, the metric on the surface downstairs can be written as e to some function of z dz. And I can write it as e to a function just because it's a positive function. So I can take its log and call it this row. And, um, and you can check that if the, the Laplacian of this row is, is related to the Gaussian curvature of the surface. And, um, and so if this Laplacian is equal to zero, then rho is uh, harmonic. And in that case, it turns out the surface is, is flat. Okay, so if you want to, this whole story essentially says that if you want to choose a random surface, one way to do it is to uh, start with a disk and choose a random function rho. Okay, so we talk, have now talked about two ways of choosing a random surface. One is you start with a random pair of trees and you glue them together in some way. And there's actually a continuum analog of that construction. Start with a continuum or pair of random trees, identify them together, um, and that forms you a, uh, a random surface. Here I'm saying a completely different way of doing it is instead of starting with two trees, you start with a disk. And then you put a random function on that disk. And that tells you what the surface is as parametrized by this disk. Okay, so we have two very different but related approaches. And, um, and you might ask, if you want your surface to be somehow a perturbation of a flat metric, you might want to choose rho as somehow a perturbation of a harmonic function. I mean, it sort of wants to be harmonic. Um, you penalize it for failure to be harmonic in some way, and then choose randomly among those objects. And, uh, and it turns out the natural way of doing that is something called the Gaussian free field. Uh, so it's a particular way of making a two-dimensional random surface. Um, uh, basically, if I give you a, a graph, it's the random function where the probability of the function is given by, uh, is proportional to e to the minus the sum of the height differences squared. So I choose, here this is just an n by n grid, and I choose a random function on the n by n grid by saying uh, the probability of a given function is the sum over all edges of the difference in that function from one edge to another squared. Okay, so that's a particular way of choosing a random function, and there's a natural limit of this, which is uh, the Gaussian free field. Okay, but the interesting thing about this Gaussian free field, uh, for those who haven't seen this before, is that it's not actually a function, per se. It lives in this world of generalized functions um, or distributions. It means that even though it's, it's not defined at points, because it's sort of, when I take the limit, this starts oscillating faster and faster, and it, and it kind of in any neighborhood at any point, it sort of oscillates between plus and minus infinity all over the place. Um, but if you take the average against a smooth function, then that is something you can make sense of. Or even if I take the average on a small disk or a small line segment, you can make sense of that. So, um, and so you have this, this random distribution, and now this is what we plug in to this story here. We take our row to be the Gaussian free field, or a multiple of Gaussian free field, and then, uh, and then e to that describes a random fractal surface. Okay, and you know part of the story is you might want to know how these surfaces are related to uh, other surfaces. You know the ones we construct by gluing the squares together, for example. Um, okay, or the one we did with the two trees. All right, so here's some actual pictures of this, where I took this random, this e to the gamma h z d z, I viewed this as a random measure, and, um, and I tried to take the grid and divide it into squares in such a way that all the squares have the same size in this random measure. Okay, and that means that, so I start with a grid like this, and I have a random measure here, and I fix some size delta, and I say, I would like to divide this into squares that all have size delta. 
And the way I'll do it is I'll say, well, okay, the whole square is too big, so I'll divide it into four. Each one of these is too big, so I'll divide them into four. This one's still too big, I'll divide it into four. But this one now has area less than delta, so I leave it alone. So everything that has area bigger than delta, I divide into four. Everything that has area less than delta, I leave alone. Okay, and I continue. And at the end of the day, all of the squares in this picture have area less than delta. On the other hand, if I take any square here and look at its dyadic parent, the thing that it, you had to divide to get that square, that square is now has area bigger than delta. So, so in that sense, you can say all these squares have area about delta. They're all a little less than delta. Their dyadic parents are a little bit more than delta. But roughly, these are all squares of the same size. Okay, And this is one way of visualizing the metric. Here you have a bunch of squares in this picture. And you can see that um, you know, here these are big squares. And here these are small squares. We've also used colors to, to illustrate. So here this square is bigger by a factor of 2, 4, 8, 16. 32, 64 from squares of this color. So here you see a lot of this color and a lot of this color. So the squares here really differ in size from the squares here by about a factor of 32. Even though in the random surface they're the same size. And I want to know, this is something similar we saw in this picture where we started with a random graph and then mapped it onto the disk. Some of the circles in the random graph, I mean, they all had the same size in the original random graph, but when we kind of map them in a nice way via circle packing onto this disk, what you find is that um, some of these are very tiny and some of them are big. Because you have this particular random s structure. And here, this is supposed to be of the same flavor as that. When you map it, you think of it as you have this wild random surface, but when you map it in the plane, you get some big squares and some little squares. Okay. And, uh, and we understand these random surfaces very well in lots of different ways. You can compute areas of sets. You can compute lengths of curves. Um, there's a lot you can say about them. Okay, so now, now I want to summarize some work that has been done recently in a paper with uh, Duplantier and Miller about some form of the convergence of these random surfaces uh, to these Euclidean models. Um, so, it turns out, if I give you a topological manifold with a measure, a finite measure on it, then as long as that measure is what we call a good measure, meaning that it doesn't have any atoms and it assigns positive mass to every open set, that measure is topologically equivalent to any other surface with a measure. So if I just say I give you a surface with some measure on it, you can find a homeomorphism to another surface with a measure on it in such a way that the measure here is the pullback of the measure up here. If I tell you I've got a sphere with a, with a measure on it without point masses, um, then uh, this is called the uh, von Neumann uh, Oxidy Oolong theorem. It's from 1941. It's a great result. It says that there's really only one way to have a topological manifold, a topological sphere with a measure, a nice measure on it. You can map it to any other sphere with a, a nice measure you know, in a way that maps the measure to the measure and the topology to the topology. A you know, homeomorphism that preserves the measure. Um, so, so there's really kind of one canonical guy, which is your surface with a measure. And now you can think about adding additional structure to the one canonical guy. So if you take this one canonical guy and you add a space filling curve to it, which you can think of the space filling curve as the interface between a pair of trees. So you take this canonical surface and you put this pair of trees on it then that gives you an object that we would call the piano sphere. That's the name for it. So piano sphere is this sphere with a measure and a space filling path. 
And it's basically like having it in some structure. You have a kind of a nice way to explore the surface, a kind of a canonical way to trace through the surface. Um, so we think of this, this GT as our um, kind of tabula rasa. This is just exists on its own. Uh, this is a, a measure of um, uh, a, a topological manifold of, of total mass T. And then I can add uh, this spanning tree and get what I call a canosphere. I can add this conformal structure and get what I call Lugo quantum gravity. So that's now, when I have it embedded in the plane, this measure in some natural way. I can think of it, here I thought of it as I start with this sphere that has a conformal structure and I add the measure on it. But I can also think of it as I start with the manifold with measure and I add conformal structure. So in some cases that's a more natural perspective. And, or I can also think of I add a metric space structure. And one way, when you add a metric space structure this, you get something called this, this Brownian map. And um, basically it's this new paper, which uh, we hope will be on the archive fairly soon, it's a, it's a long paper, um, actually shows that if you take this Lugo quantum gravity surface and decorate it with a particular space filling SLE, then this is equivalent to the piano sphere. Another way to think of that is that if I just give you this pair of continuum random trees and glue them together, topologically it makes a sphere. And now I tell you there's a canonical way to embed this object into conformally into a sphere. So now it has a formal structure. And when you do that, this the interface between the curves becomes this space filling SLE curve and the uh, um, the so the interface becomes a space filling SLE curve, and the measure becomes this Lugo quantum gravity measure. All right, so anyway, that's, uh, and here's kind of a, a picture of one of these continuous space filling paths traced by color. So I start here, go here, and you can, oh, anyway. Um, so, so the point is, there are three really natural ways to add structure to your kind of generic vanilla sphere with measure. You can add structure by putting a conformal structure on it, so you've got the measure embedded in the sphere in a nice way, in an actual, you know, you put it in the sphere. Uh, you can do it by putting on a metric space structure, so you can measure distances between pairs of points, or you can do it with this exploration surface. You know, you, I give you a, a a, random sp a particular space filling path that gives you a pair of trees. And in some sense, that pair of trees, it gives you a notion of two directions. At every point, you have a, an east and a west, because I, I declare one tree to be pointing east, the other tree to be pointing west, if you like. So it gives me a, a compass at every point, and because it gives me a compass at every point, that sort of gives me a, a conformal structure. It tells me what angles are, and I, and I can kind of embed this in some sense in a, an angle-preserving way canonically into the plane once I have this piano sphere structure. Okay, so three, what I think are kind of equally beautiful and natural structures you can, you can put on this. And they're all kind of very, uh, um, things, you know, that, that really have been developed independently um, over the years. I mean, this, this piano sphere in some sense goes back to uh, I mean, the discrete version of it would go back to Mullen in the, in the 60s, who thought, you know, about growing this pair of trees together. Um, and, you know, we're kind of making sense of the, the continuum analog of that. Okay. Um, and so now we're working on really connecting all these surfaces. But, but at the beginning of this talk, I didn't tell you I was going to talk about surfaces. I said I was going to talk about growth models. That's what the pictures were. So, how did those actually come in? Okay, well, first, this is something called first passage percolation. Let's say I, I give you a graph, any graph with vertices and edges, and I assign to every edge a random number, which I say is, I chose from the exponential distribution. So it's a random positive number. This 
turns the graph into a metric space. Well, the graph was already a metric space. I mean, the distance from one edge to another, one vertex to another, is the length of the shortest path between them. Um, but now I have sort of a weighted graph, where I say the distance from here to here is, I take the, the length of the path is the sum of the edge weights along the path. <coughs> And I find the length of the shortest path between a pair of points. That gives me a distance. <coughs> and, um, uh, and so this is just a way of generating a random metric space. That's all it is. Um, and it was introduced, uh, ver well, Eden did a variant of this in 1961. Hammersley and Welch, 65, did the actual first passive percolation. If you do this on Z2, um, and you do it for a uh, kind of a very fine grid, this is what it actually looks like. So here, we pick a point, and these are colored according to their distance from the origin in this random metric. Okay, so you get this kind of randomly growing ball, and this is, well, this is a growth process. Because if I imagine looking at the ball of radius r and letting r gradually increase, then you will see that this shape gradually gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, and looks kind of like one form of those growing things I was showing in the beginning. This particular thing is, turns out that if you take the um, uh, limit, this, this macroscopic shape will be a, a random, sort of in the limit as this gets large, it converts to a deterministic convex shape. And initially people thought this shape would be a, a, a disk, but um, now, you know, with computer simulations, it seems pretty clear it's not exactly a disk. That somehow the rate at which uh, distances go in, in this direction is not exactly the same as the way they go in the diagonal direction. Which, I guess, is no real reason to think that they should be the same. Um, but it looks like some sort of a roundish shape. And if you ask, so even though kind of macroscopically it's somehow boring, it's just a deterministic convex shape, if you look at the fluctuations here, these are believed, conjectured to be governed by the so-called KPZ fluctuations, which um, will be the subject of Ivan's talk. Um, at least I think they are. Is that going to be in your talk? Yes, yes, he's not. That's right. So, um, so we'll be talking about Ivan's talk is kind of zoom in near here and ask what are the microscopic fluctuations. So everything today I'm going to be talking about macroscopic fluctuations for my talk. Um, okay. Um, all right, so, uh, well, by the way, if, if you do a, an isotropic lattice, say you replace Z2 with a Voronoi tessellation generated by a Poisson processor, some lattice that kind of has rotational invariance built in, then they can show that this actually does convert to a, a disk. So that the kind of the, the length of time it takes you to get to a faraway point uh, tells you the distance between those two points. All right. Um, Here's a picture of how you actually grow it. And it turns out the Bar 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 Markovian property of, um, of the exponential distribution, the memoryless property, uh, another way to grow this process is to say that at any time I choose uniformly from the neighbors of the set of vertices I've added so far, and I add that vertex. So, so I start with empty. I pick uniformly from its four neighbors. Now I have six neighbors of these two guys, and I pick one of them uniformly. Now I have some set of neighbors of these guys. I pick one uniformly from that, and continue and gradually it grows. Okay, this is very easy to code up on a computer. And um, here's a version of this though where I did it on a planar map. And so here I, I'm going to work on triangles. I'm going to pick randomly an edge. And I'm going to add the triangle. That so I imagine there's a whole unexplored random surface. I haven't seen the outside of it yet. But I'm going to pick a random edge and say what's the edge triangle on the other side of this edge from this triangle. And I'm going to add that. Pick a random edge, add the triangle. Pick a random edge, add the triangle. And continue, and I get this growth process. Okay? And, um, and so we want to make sense now of this sort of growth process on a random surface. And that picture I showed you at the beginning, that lovely picture with the growing, was exactly this. It was this thing growing on a random surface. Um, so on one of these random Lugo quantum gravity surfaces. So we had it embedded with the squares. And we just on that graph of squares, 
on one of these guys here. I just do the Eden model on this graph. And it grows, and now suddenly it's not growing so smoothly anymore. Because there's randomness in the metric as well. So there's certain places. I mean, you think of it, if you have your petri dish with bacteria gradually spreading out, there may be some parts of the petri dish that are healthier for bacteria than others. Somewhere there's more food than others. And, um, and if you have randomness at the surface, then the thing is not growing like an actual sphere. It's growing like a, a random. And that's, I mean, if you have an actual petri dish with bacteria, you'll look that it's, it's not growing exactly round. There's some weird structure to it. Okay, and if that weird structure happens to be of this move of quantum gravity type, then you would get these sort of pictures that we're drawing. Okay. Anyway. Um, uh, okay. So here's another variant. One thing you can do, a different way to grow a structure, is to say that I'm going to color all of the vertices blue and yellow, and I'm going to follow the path that divides the blue ones from the yellow ones. For each triangle, I come in through one edge that divides blue from yellow, I exit through the opposite edge that divides blue from yellow. And I could explore this way. And I can imagine exploring the whole surface this way. And that should converge to one of these, we call SLE6, random paths. And, um, but you might ask, what if I do a hybrid between these two approaches? I grow for a little while, and then I forget my location. I pick a new edge, and I grow from there with percolation for a little while. Pick a new edge, grow from there with percolation for a little while, and I iterate that. Th this should kind of be the same in the long distance limit. Um, you know, if I'm say, always growing for five steps, and then pick another point. And this, you know, it should still look the same in the limit. But the nice thing about this approach is that we can make sense of it in the continuum. So there is actually a uh, continuum structure where, um, you know, I kind of imagine I take this continuum surface, I can formally map it to a disk. Uh, we kind of believe that this surface is blue of quantum gravity, this, uh, this path becomes an SLE6, and you can imagine that I then grow a little bit of the SLE6, and I forget where the tip is, put it somewhere random. Grow a little SLE6, forget where the tip is, put it somewhere random. Grow SLE6, forget, and iterate. And the nice thing about this SLA6 with tip randomization is that we can actually show um, that you can get a limiting process. You can take a limit of these, uh, these growth models that gives you a, um, a continuum growth process. And, uh, and that, this continuum growth process, um, satisfies some, some form of a stochastic differential equation which is kind of complicated to explain how it works. But this is one of those rare cases, KPZ is another one of the rare cases, where you can actually make sense of a growth process mathematically given by a complicated stochastic differential equation. I mean, usually these things are, are too hard to understand. Um, oh, I guess we've got Martin Heyer here who can uh, show us many uh, examples where, where you can make sense of them. But most things you think of are actually too hard to deal with. But this is a case where it makes sense. So here's an actual metric ball in this random thing. And if you look at the way it's growing, it's growing according to this QLE that we can now describe mathematically. Okay. Generally, um, there's a variant of QLE which says, instead of choosing your boundary location uniformly from the set of possible points, you could say, choose the boundary location from harmonic measure, viewed from far away. Um, or, choose it from harmonic measure to some power. So this eta parameter says, choose from harmonic measure to the eta power. So basically, QLE with this gamma squared eta should be your, um, your eta, your gamma tells you what type of a random surface you have. Remember, it's e to the gamma times the Gaussian free field that describes the measure for the random surface. So the gamma tells you the type of random surface, and eta tells you the type of growth model. Do you choose a new uh, face to add uniformly from the set of possibilities, or do you choose from harmonic measure from far away? Or harmonic measure to some power? So first pass is percolation, if eta is one, this DLA, where you just choose from harmonic measure, 
is uh, 8 equals 1. And the generally, this is called a dielectric breakdown model uh, for general values of eta. And so here's an actual picture of Euclidean DLA. Okay, these Euclidean DLAs have been studied especially in places like I come from, Boston, because they, they resemble snowflakes. And, um, and there's intuition, I don't know, is there a word for snowflakes down here? There are these, um, I guess, you know, these kind of white things, they fall from the sky, they have a sort of crystal structure. And if you can imagine how they're formed, is you, you have a, a, a tiny particle of dust or water molecule or something, and you can imagine that you have a, another particle of water, random kind of, randomly floating through the sky, and when it hits your cluster, it blocks onto it. Another one floats from far away, and when it hits your cluster, it blocks onto it. And, um, and gradually it grows that way. And, uh, and if, you, if you kind of take this naive model for a snowflake growth, you get, you get what we call DLA. You kind of take a random walk from far away, and when it hits your cluster, you add a new site at the place where you hit your cluster. And then you, you repeat, adding these particles one at a time. And as you saw in the simulation, you know, this could be seen as something kind of growing in time. So it's a, it's a growth process. And here the colors indicate the time at which the point was added. So these were the first layer to be added. And you kind of see this is, it's a weird spinal thing, but it's still, in some sense, you can see a circle here because the tips all seem to be about the same distance from the origin. Um, but now here's in some actual DLA clusters that occur in nature. Uh, so here's copper sulfate solution. You have some uh, molecules developing on here. They actually produce these things. Here, these are some rocks you find where there's some growth process on the surface, kind of a two-dimensional thing where uh, so these are manganese oxide patterns on the surface of a rock. Take it from Physics Today, 2000. Uh, has them. Um, here, here's another picture of that. This picture here is an actual frozen bolt of lightning. So how do you freeze lightning? You, you take a, a block of plexiglass and you run a high voltage charge through it. That's lightning. And the lightning actually changes the structure of the plexiglass that it passes through uh, so that it then looks different. And then after the lightning's gone through, you can take your glass and see where the lightning went. So this is a frozen lightning bolt. And these frozen lightning bolts are believed to be modeled by these, uh, these uh, DBM models with some eta values. So that's kind of one of the standard models they use for this. Dielectric breakdown models. OK. Um, now if you look at DLA on Google, you'll find 12,000 papers, but they're almost all in the physics literature. I actually went through the first 500 of them by hand and checked how many were in physics journals as opposed to math journals. And there were only four of the first 500 that were actually in math journals. Um, it's because DLA is a game played by physicists primarily, and it is studied using simulations. So they come up with some variant of DLA that matches some statistical model they want to study. They do a simulation of it. So rather than proving a theorem, which is how we would attack it, they do a simulation. It's much faster, it's much more efficient. They get an answer very quickly of what it looks like. They can look and calculate things, exponents, whatever, see if they match the real world. And, uh, and that's how they do it. And, and despite these you know, 12,000 papers, we have not, as mathematicians, contributed all that much to the theory compared to what the physicists have done. And, um, and so one of our goals has been to try to sort of at least find some version of DLA that we can make sense of mathematically. And um, so you might ask, does DLA have a scaling limit? Is the shape random or large scale? Does this macroscopic shape look like a tree? You know, any, anything you can have about it. Here's, um, you know, Strong, Hoyer oh, Strong, his uh, uh, ICM proceedings cited Harry Kester's result in the diameter of DLA uh, after n steps is at most distance n to the two thirds from the origin, and then said that's essentially the only theorem concerning two dimensional DLA. Um, although I found that when I show this, people who have proof theorems about DLA might get a little offended. I mean, there have been some 
some theorem, but really nothing on the level of understanding really the structure of the scaling limit of this guy. What is this? What's the continuum analog of this random uh, structure I've added? Um, so it's in some sense an embarrassment for mathematicians that we haven't contributed more uh, to this subject because it, it's so huge. In the real world, we see these things all around us in coral reefs or um, well, obviously uh, snowflakes, uh, you know, plant growth patterns, bacteria. I mean, very many places we have these growth models. Um, why don't we understand them better? Well, what if we try to understand DLA on random planar maps? Here's a DLA on a particular surface. This is a root two Louisville quantum gravity surface. And um, I, I was just talking with Ivan about this on the way here, that often in math you solve a problem and then try to convince people that was the problem you cared most about all along. So I would like to convince you that the Euclidean world is actually boring. It's very superficial resemblance to the actual random world we live in. And in fact, what you really want to do is do DLA on a root two Louisville quantum gravity surface. Okay, that's the problem that you should care about. And, um, and it turns out that for this version of the problem, we can actually make some sense of the limiting growth process. And we can actually show that there is a continuum analog of this growth model that we can describe. And it's coupled in a nice way with the, with the Louisville quantum gravity surface. And we can describe the stochastic differential equation in some sense that it solves. And um, so we can actually make sense of it. And in fact, there's a whole curve of parameters for uh, gamma squared and eta for which we can make sense of these guys. And, and it's basically using these SLE typically randomization tricks I, I kind of gave a sense for. And, um, and it turns out that along this curve, one of them is one that uh, everyone cared about even before we got involved, which is pure quantum gravity. Uh, so eight thirds, turns out that's what they call pure quantum gravity. That means there's no statistical physics model on the random surface. It's just what you get when you glue together a bunch of squares randomly, like I showed you at the beginning. And this zero means it's, it's the Eden model, which means this growth model actually describes the metric space structure. So using this one, we can understand the metric space structure of Lewis quantum gravity and show that the Brownian map is connected in the essentially the same object as, uh, as Lewis quantum gravity. So we, we establish that, we can establish that big connection. Um, and here, this other dot is the one that I just convinced you, I hope, was, was the other important dot in the universe. It's, it's because it's, it's DLA, um, which has been hugely important uh, in physics. Okay. And so, you know, our thing, we, we show existence of this QLE processes on the surface. We derive the FPE, they satisfy. We get continuity of the outer boundary of the growth at a given time. We have various properties for sample path behavior. There's a graduate student at MIT, Ewan Gwynn, who's, who's just recently done some great new work on, on this. And um, we have work in progress. It's not on the uh, archive yet. Um, it may take us a while, but showing that this uh, QLE uh, really gives you a distance function on quantum gravity. It connects those two objects. And um, we'd really like to understand QLE off the curve. And anyone here who's a, an SCE expert um, who would you know, like to take a look at this paper and, and give us a hand, uh, you know, we, we'd love to have new ideas uh, for getting off the curve. Um, okay, and that's it. <laughs>